Um, there are probably a good number of passages of Scripture that all of us know. John 3.16, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, John 1.1, 1, 1, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, you know, and most likely Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And that Acts passage reads, reads, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And that's important, especially in Restoration Movement churches as well as many others, in that uh, the way that we conduct our weekly Sunday services, uh, the way that we do that now, uh, that reflects, to a certain degree, uh, what they did then in the early church, some nearly 2,000 years ago. You know, we corporately devote ourselves to hearing a message from Scripture, uh, from God's Word. Um, Realize that they didn't have this back then. They didn't have the red letter words of Jesus in the New Testament. It hadn't been written yet. You know, so what they had, they had letters from the apostles. And they sat down and they praised God. And they, they looked at the Old Testament. They did all of those sorts of things. They didn't have the first-hand accounts like you and I have. But they would also break bread. Uh, and we do that today in our, our observance of the Lord's Supper. We devote ourselves to one another. That's the fellowship aspect. And we pray. And there are other things that we could add to the list, such as praise and worship, lifting our, our voices um, in, in song and in, in, uh, in worship. I think those were integral parts of what the early church did as well. And, and realistically, we know that these practices must be important of, in the life of the church now because they were important in the life of the church then. But prayer especially, prayer especially in my mind often gets pushed off, uh, gets pushed off to the side as being less important or something of a luxury. Don't we do that sometimes? It's, well, prayer, you know, be sure you pray a lot if that's where you're gifted. Or, or be, be sure to pray, you know, if, if you have that kind of time. Well, my proposal is this, and, and I'm stealing it from Bill Hybels. Uh, we're too busy not to pray. The Protestant reformer Martin Luther, he declared this, and I quote, I have so much business that I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, said that God does nothing but in response to prayer. And so John Wesley spent two hours a day in prayer. And by the look on some of your faces, I can see that for me to ask for such a dedication to prayer each day would be met by more than the raised eyebrows that I see. Honestly, if we look at Luther and Wesley, we look at some of those more modern superheroes of the Christian faith, they didn't necessarily even live up to what Paul encouraged the church to do, uh, the church in Thessalonica, to, what to strive for. 1 Thessalonians five sixteen through 18 reads this, Be joyful always, as if that's not hard enough, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all good circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Turns out that does speak to God's purpose for our lives a little bit, doesn't it? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So what are we supposed to do? I mean, the bar seems like it's set very high. We have those who spent two and three hours in prayer each day. We have Paul telling us to, to be joyful always, to be in prayer continually. We have, history tells us of these more monastic types. These are the guys that would be out in the desert and they would just pray. I mean, that's, that, that's what they did. I mean, in our modern context, what are we supposed to do? How am I supposed to pray continually if I have a hard enough time to remember to pray before I go to work every day? I mean, isn't that a, a, an important question to ask? And realize that if that's you, you're not alone. For many, prayer comes with a whole host of difficulties. That short list might include things like getting distracted. Not having the time. There's uh, anyone here ever fallen asleep when they're trying to pray at night? Yeah, get them up there. We're in church, people. All right. See, it's you're not alone if you've ever struggled with any of that stuff. Then there's you know just the simply forgetting 
among many other things that are hindrances to us in this practice of prayer. And so this morning, we're going to take kind of a bird's eye view as to uh, how we can plug into the power of prayer. Because prayer is one of these, uh, I like to call it battle rattle. Uh, battle rattle was a term they used back in World War I and II that really described all of the tools that the soldiers took with them out into war. And prayer is one of our tools. It is one of the things that we get to take each and every day into battle. It's one of the tools and the practices that God has given us to fight the good fight, and we should know the what, the why, and the how of prayer. And so first of all, the what. Prayer, a very uh, 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 boiled down to a concise definition, prayer is our communication with God. It's that short, it's that simple. It's not this big, complex definition. It is our communication with God. It is the means through which we present our offerings of praise and our requests for his intercession. You know, that is, that is our asking God to bless, heal, or, or deliver, asking God to honor our request with his action or his response. Make sense? We're asking God to do something. We're asking God to speak. We're asking God to reveal himself. We're asking God to, to do as God does. And even in that, that little definition, this little definition of prayer is communication with God, realize that that's not one way. That works both ways. God speaks. We may not, not only are we speaking to God, and we may not be doing that verbally, it might be just thinking right? might be those foxhole prayers that you just kind of think, that you offer up. But God is also responding to those, and oftentimes we're speaking too loudly to actually hear his voice, but that's a whole other sermon entirely. And so we may not hear God's voice. It may not be audible. We might not see this manifestation of God literally, have that burning bush sort of Moses moment, Though God's response, his answer to that prayer, even though that might not be immediate, God responds to prayer. And so this week I've been chewing on this a little bit. I'm trying to get better in the area of prayer. I'm trying to grow there. I'm trying to spend more time with the Lord personally. And so I was thinking a lot about this and praying about it. Makes sense, right? And, uh, and something dawned on me. Have you ever really thought about prayer? I mean, just really thought about how profound prayer really is. Because when it comes right down to it, it's me. It is sinful me, one who has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Guess what? That's you too. It is sinful me having this opportunity, this honor, and this privilege of going to God, the author and the creator of life, personally, directly, with my prayers. Now, I was trying to figure out a way to illustrate this, and the best I can do is in earthly terms, and so go with me on this. What if you had one of those red phones on your, your desk that you, we used to see in the movies? Maybe they're still in the movies, I'm not really sure. You know, the phones that were reserved for an international emergency. The, you know, that red phone that sat on the president's desk. Now, what if you had the opportunity, the honor, and the privilege of picking up that phone and calling the President of the United States of America whenever you had a personal uh, emergency, whenever you, well, anytime you were thankful for something, anytime you needed the President to act specifically on your behalf or on the behalf of someone in your life, you could just pick up the phone and call. You could just pick up the phone and call the leader of the free world, and he would just put some people on the problem. It's good to know people in high places, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know. Regardless of what you think about the president, I bet you would pick up that phone a lot. Wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? What an amazing privilege that would be. How much greater is our privilege of... of not knowing the president, but of knowing him who created all of this out of nothing, 
out of nothingness and he breathed life into it. How much greater is it that when, uh, when tr- triumph or tragedy strike that we have a dedicated line to our Father in heaven? That phone's on the desk. And for some reason, we oftentimes don't pick up the receiver. You know, we don't have to go to the temple to make a sacrifice for our sins. We don't have to go out to the pasture and look for the the lamb without blemish. We don't have to go, you know, find the the dove or the sparrow. We don't have to find the, the red heifer that the law of Moses requires for certain sacrifices at certain times for specific things. We don't have to do that. Our sins, those have all been paid for. The blood of Christ is sufficient for, for all of our trespasses that have already taken place and even for those yet to come. That's amazing to me. We look at the book of Hebrews, it tells us that we have this great high priest who goes to God on our behalf and we can communicate with the author and perfecter of life wherever we are. All of a sudden, that red phone on the desk, it becomes mobile, doesn't it? Boy, didn't life change when all of a sudden cell phones came around? It isn't I need to go over here to offer a sacrifice. It isn't I need to go over here to pray. It isn't over, well, do I have a nickel or 25? I remember when they went from 25 to 35 cents. That was annoying. You know, to use a pay phone. We have that privilege everywhere we go. Everywhere. But yet, for some reason, we don't talk to God as often or as with great of meaning as we probably should be. We've been given this amazing gift that not only do we get to voice our concerns to him, do we get to talk to God, but he listens. He delights in our prayers. It talks about the prayers of the saints being like incense. And he responds to those things. Those, not, not just petitions, because we're really good at going to God as like a you know, supernatural Santa Claus. Like, God, I need something from you. You know, the, the checkbook's pretty tight, or I got this big meeting coming up tomorrow, or, you know, I need you to, to heal this person in my life, or maybe even it's me. And so we're really, really good about asking, how good are we about going to God to say, you know what, regardless of what's going on in my life, you are awesome. And just being thankful. That's prayer. That's our primary mode of communication with God. So with that being said, why should we bother spending time in prayer? I hope we've already answered that question, to be completely honest. I mean, since God created the world and everything in it, I mean, since he and he alone knows the events of the world, since he knows what's going to take place, why do I need to bother? Doesn't he already know all that stuff? Why should, all, why should I bother praying when all these things are going to go according to his divine will anyway? The first reason we need to be a people of prayer is because God honors our requests. And I know we've kind of already uh, hit that already, but I really think that we need to understand what that means. That we need to get a better realization of what that means. God did not simply set the world into motion all those years ago and now just sit back and watch everything that takes place according to his plan. To watch everything just kind of unfold and, yep, that's how I planned it, yep, that's how I planned that and just let it go. It wasn't the, the, you know, the, the top. He didn't just start the top spinning in motion, sit back and let it do its thing. Because God is living and he's active in this world and he's given us this amazing honor of being called co-laborers. We are co-laborers with Christ. We're a part of a bigger story than we will ever really begin to, uh, to, to grasp. We We play integral roles in this larger story, in the larger events of of everything that's going on in the world. James 5.16 tells us this. It says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Our prayers mean something. And you know what? We're not always that righteous, are we? We aren't always that righteous. Or at all righteous. But in Christ Jesus, we are. We are clothed with his righteousness. 
you, sinful man, sinful woman, me, sinful man, are made righteous in Jesus. That means that your prayers are powerful and effective. And through prayer, we become a part of this amazing redemptive process that God has going on in our world. He honors our prayers. We get to be a part of something amazing. You know, and if you want proof, take, take God working through Abraham back way back in Genesis 18. God said, look, Sodom and Gomorrah, these places, uh, they are an absolute abomination. It is time to wipe them off of the face of the earth. And in the end, they were. God doesn't lie. He makes good on his promises. But before they were completely and utterly laid to waste, Abraham pleaded with God for the inhabitants of those cities. Abraham wrestled with God on account of those people, on behalf of those people. And, you know, first it was, Lord, if there are 50, will you spare them? And then there wasn't 50. Lord, if, there, if there's 45, and then 40, and then 30, and then 20, and then finally 10. The whole while, God is agreeing to spare the cities if there were that many righteous among them. We can fast forward to the end of that narrative, that story, and see that the cities were still destroyed. God makes good on his promises. But we also see that Lot and his wife, for a while, <laughs> and his daughters, well, they were delivered. We tend to look past the fact that the prayers of Abraham were honored in that decision-making process. The prayers of Abraham mattered. They made a difference when it came to, to God's decree to lay Sodom and Gomorrah to waste. I mean, stop and think about that. God's plan was to lay him to waste. Did God's plan come to fruition? This is the part where you nod your head. Yep. Did prayer have any effect on God's plan? Abraham pleaded with God. God's plan still came about. But we got to see some righteous people delivered in that process. There are so many more stories in both the Old and the New Testament where the prayers of the righteous affect how God works in his creation. Evil spirits are cast out by prayer and fasting. Uh, that verse that I plucked out of James about the prayer of a righteous man or woman being powerful and effective, that actually means a lot more when it's read within its entire context. Let me, let me just read that for you. So James 5, verses 13 through, let's run through 18. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Our prayers are more than just music to God's ears. They're more than just a way for us to tell God that we need something. If the only time I ever talked with my wife was to tell her that I needed something, probably wouldn't like me a whole lot. I think our spouses enjoy hearing thank you, enjoy hearing compliments, saying that I love you. Don't you think we should do the same for God? Our prayers are more than just music to God's ears. They are heard and they had answered and, and they may not be answered in the way that we want them to be. But God answers prayer. The results of earnest prayer, they can impact the world around us in ways that we cannot even begin to understand. We just need to co-labor with God on our knees. 
And the second reason I feel that we need to be a people of prayer is that through our time spent alone with God, or even corporately, we are renewed and we are transformed. There is absolutely power in prayer. The more time we spend seeking the face of God, the more we will begin to reflect his image. The more we will begin to reflect his image. I Think about advertising to illustrate this a little bit. Just think about the commercials you see on television. Think about what you see in print media. Most of the time, the world around us presents us with an image of who we are aren't because we're we're not as the world makes us appear you know i never have been nor will i ever be a model i do not live up to the fleshly standard of what the world sees as beauty i've come to terms with that i thought for sure there'd be a couple amens in there thank you for that we're here to edify one another aren't we but you know what my god My God sees beauty in me, for in his image I am made, and for in his image you all are made. I may never be as successful as those on television, I may never be as smart as those who write the books that I read, but my God values me and he values you. I have been wonderfully and fearfully made, and when I enter into the presence of God, when I enter into his rest, and, and, and I, I, I'm able to shed all of those things that the world tells me that I am not, and I get the opportunity, the honor, and the privilege to see who I am in his eyes. To see who I am as he created me to be. Spending time in prayer with God yields an understanding of who we really are in Christ Jesus. The true you. Who you really are. We are more than conquerors. We are powerful individuals. We are whiter than snow washed by the blood of Christ. And though we may sin, though we may stumble, when we go before that throne of grace to confess our sins and to seek forgiveness, we are renewed, we are transformed, we are forgiven. The image of God in us is constantly under attack by this fallen world. And I realize it sounds weird to talk about this kind of weird spiritual realities that are difficult to understand and difficult to conceptualize, but you know what? It's truth. It's all there in God's Word. There is stuff going on out there that we do not understand, that we can't see, that we can't, you know, our empirical senses Don't pick up on it. We can't taste, smell, touch. I don't know, hear. I'm missing one. There's another sense in there somewhere. There's more to it. We are constantly told who we're not. So enter into the God's grace, into God's presence to find out who you really are. And be transformed to reflect the perfection that is Christ Jesus. Time spent with God in prayer affects not only the world around us, but who we are and how we understand who we are to be. So the next logical question is, you know, we we talked about what prayer is. We kind of talked about, well, what prayer does. Now's the big question. It's the how. Well, how how do you pray? Oddly enough, we have a big passage in Scripture. There were some guys that were you know, just as rock-headed as some of us that said, Lord, teach us how to pray, right? But let's be honest here. Remembering to spend time with God in prayer is tough sometimes, isn't it? You know, maybe we just forget. Maybe you're the chronic snooze buttoner. That passage we read in James said something about Therefore, confess your sins to each other. Anybody a snooze button smasher? Yeah? You know, maybe the business of our lives is just so busy that we, we just don't pray. You know, I, I, have, I, I know we've already dealt with the why we need to be. So with that out of the way, the question now is one more of practicality. 
we're, we're, we're too busy to pray. When in all actuality, we really are too busy not to pray. The word of God tells us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Well, that's the short answer. You know, I've read a bunch of books and I've listened to a pile of sermons on the topic of prayer and they all boil down to this scriptural truth. So I'm going to save you the time to listen to listening to all those messages and reading all those books. Two words, just pray. That's it. That really is the whole picture. Like, medita- like meditation or, or some of those other things, meditating on the Word of God, there's no secret recipe for entering into the presence of God. It's just pray. Call out to Him and enter into His presence. It really is as simple as that. And here's where the difficulty lies. I think, at least for me, and maybe you're a little bit like me, how do, how, how do we do that? Because we, we, we like lists. Step one, step two, Men, even though we don't read the instructions, it's nice to be able to go to them when we mess everything up, right? So we want everything laid out in steps. I mean, can you imagine if you went and bought something from the store, something real complicated, and it said step one, put it together? I mean, but, but that really is what it is. And I don't know about most of you, but first thing that happens to me when I wake up in, in, uh, in the morning is my mind is just racing, My mind is just racing with all the things I need to get accomplished that day, all the the, the meetings I may have, what I would like to get accomplished that day. Back up, even before I decide to get out of bed. Everyone knows which half hour of sleep is the most important, right? It's the last one. It's that last half hour. That is... If you don't get that last half hour, that's, it, it's going to be a bad day. If you have to wake up a half hour early, no, nope, might as well write the day off as a loss at that point right there. We all know that the last half hour of sleep is crucial. That's the most important one of them all, and that difficulty is overcome by entering into the rest of God. Give a little, receive a lot. Ask, and it will be given to you. Ask God to help you with your prayer life. Our flesh, we like things like music. We like things like that last bit of sleep. The 10 minutes, or the recurring 10 minutes we get from hitting the snooze button. We like the newspaper. We like television. We like, you know, mindlessly surfing the internet. We like those distractions in our life. And whatever stands in the way of you and me entering into the presence of God... Well, it can be overcome by entering into the presence of God. I know it's kind of a chicken or egg sort of thing, but we just need to pray. It's okay to ask God to give you a heart for prayer. We have to start somewhere. Ask him to give you the desire to pray. If you want to grow in prayer, You need to pray. If you want to grow in your faith, you need to pray. And and so now it's, you know, so maybe you have that active mind like I do, and the first thing you do in the morning is you start thinking about how you're going to fit that into the waking hours of your day. It automatically turns, for me, my mind turns to all the things that need to be handled that day. Um... And so I was always distracted. And, and I'm still distracted in prayer oftentimes now. I'm distracted by all those things that popped up because I always thought of them as distractions. And here's how I personally work through that. And, and this isn't my invention. Uh, I took it from someone much wiser than myself, so... Um, It's technically not plagiarizing. I just don't know which source to cite. Um, I started thinking about those things as what I'm supposed to be praying about. You have a big meeting coming up, pray about it. You have a busy schedule that day, pray about it. Instead of seeing those things running through your mind as distractions from communication, uh, 
Distractions from communion with God, see them as the beginning of your prayer list. And just pray those distractions right out of your mind. God doesn't just desire prayers of praise or prayers in sickness or, or uh, in, in times of sickness or emergency. He desires to talk with us. He desires to walk with us through every moment of every day of our lives. It, even that meeting that you're dreading in the afternoon. No matter how trivial the task, God wants to be involved in your life. A guy by the name of Brother Lawrence, he wrote a fantastic little book called Practice of the Presence of God. I think it's probably free online even. Um, it says that he prayed while washing dishes and scrubbing floors in the monastery. You know, you don't need to be at bedside on your knees praying. You can pray continually. When I was an undergrad, I took the radio out of my car so I couldn't turn it on. And to this day, I don't turn the radio on in the car. That's time for prayer. Just think about your commute. Some of you probably drive to Marshall or Olivia or New Ulm. Just imagine, you've got 20 to 40 minutes to pray every day. Oh, but you've got to drive home too. And all of a sudden you've got 40, 80 minutes to pray every day. We're too busy not to pray. Ask for the guidance of God in, in the matters and in everything of life and let him sort it out. Let your prayer list be determined by the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. I cannot begin to tell you how that practice has changed my prayer life and my life on the whole. I know that it will help you. And the, 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 this huge topic of prayer, it is just that. It is huge. This, however long we spent on this, I'd probably talk for far too long today. Um, we've barely begun to scratch the surface of it. This could hardly be considered an introduction to the necessity, the essentials, the possibilities, the reality, the purpose, or the power of prayer. Prayer is an essential tool for the believer. Our connection with God through prayer is powerful and it is effective. It can change the world. It can absolutely change the world. We need to be a people of prayer, both as individuals and as a church family. 